All right, hi, and welcome to a visiting lecture here at the University of Central Arkansas. Today's speaker is Dr. James Dow. He's visiting us from Hendricks College here in Conway, Arkansas, just across town. Uh, Dr. Dow is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religion. Is that right, Ed Hendricks as well? So just like here at UCA, Department of Philosophy and Religion. And today's topic is the aesthetics of nature, environmental philosophy. It's an exciting topic. It's a perennial topic, <laughs> as it were, right? Um, and we are very excited and honored to have Dr. Dow visiting us and presenting his lecture. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn over the floor and the, the Zoom room to Dr. Dow. Thank you. So thanks so much for having me. I appreciate um, this opportunity to share my research. And um, we're gonna be talking about nature aesthetics. And this is how do you advance now? That's the slide, there we go. So we'll start with an example of um, Art. This is uh, Richard Long's A Line Made by Walking. And this piece is a photograph. You're looking at a photograph, right? But it's a photograph that documents uh, someone walking through a natural environment. So one of the things that we're going to be asking in the context of nature aesthetics is how is art aesthetics different from nature aesthetics, right? And when we're appreciating and aesthetically appreciating the natural world, what are we doing that's different from when we're aesthetically appreciating the art, art world, right? Um, there's lots of questions that come up about how we should understand nature in the context of aesthetically appreciating nature. Um, people sometimes think of it in terms of whatever the natural scientists study. People sometimes think of it in terms of um, what is different from artifacts, right? Other times people think of nature as being beyond uh, human control. However we wanna think about that, there's a bunch of ways to approach it, but our basic question is, what are we doing when we're aesthetically appreciating uh, natural environments? There are four central nature aesthetics questions in the literature. The first is this kind of question, the ontology question, right? What is a natural environment? That question has a bunch of different answers. Partly one of the issues is in the literature, how to make sense of wilderness. Right? When we're talking about nature aesthetics, are we focusing on the appreciation of wilderness as distinct from um, cultivated places, right? artifactual places? The other question is the psychology question, which is what's relevant, psychologically speaking, to the aesthetic appreciation of natural environments. Right? So what kinds of mental states, what kinds of attitudes are core or central to the appreciation of nature? The third question is the normative question. How should we do it, right? What kinds of norms should guide our aesthetic appreciation of the natural world? Um, if we have negative appreciation, should we turn them into positive ones, right? If we're disgusted, should we reflect on that? Those kinds of normative questions, okay? And the last is the ethical question. What's the relationship between nature aesthetics and environmental ethics? Right? And traditionally in environmental ethics in the last hundred years or so, nature aesthetics has sort of been left out of the picture. People take nature aesthetics to be too subjective. They take it to be relative to perceivers. It doesn't seem like the kind of thing that should enter in to the questions of environmental value. And uh, my project is an attempt to change that, right? To diagnose why that happens historically, to analyze a variety of arguments of how we could connect nature aesthetics to environmental ethics and to kind of change the discussion, right? Uh, in the interdisciplinary space of environmental studies. So those are the basic questions. When we ask this question, and all of these questions, we have to sort of approach the two views, right? And I think really to, when you start to ask, thinking about nature aesthetics and developing theories of it, you have to ask, is it really possible, right? Is it something that we can do theoretically? Um, there's some who think that you can't. So there's the non-aesthetic view. Some people argue that aesthetic appreciation is only about art. It should only focus on art. Why? Because uh, aesthetic appreciation is judgments about solving people solving aesthetic problems, right? Figuring out how to turn materials into something that's beautiful or sublime 
or picturesque or you know, engages pleasure in some way. And those problems, that problem solving is only done by agents. And since there's no agents that created the natural world, it doesn't make sense to think about uh, aesthetic appreciation in the context of the natural world, or so, so some people have argued. So there's this question about what do we mean by aesthetics then? If we, if we are too close to thinking about it in terms of um, uh, art, then we have to like think about, well, how do we avoid this problem, right? So one, one response to this is to say that this is a too limited conception of the aesthetic, right? Um, it sort of focuses only on artifactual things. And the question is, how do we, how do we expand that notion? It's also a historically contingent thing, right? So in the 19th century, uh, romantic philosophers appreciated the natural world and thought about the aesthetic appreciation of the natural world. And it's only a matter of a kind of historical accident that people focused on aesthetics of things that humans have made. The other problem is the relativity problem, right? And the relativity view is basically that the only thing you have to do is make sure that you're appreciating nature as nature, right? Otherwise, you're totally free. It's an anything goes endeavor, right? So here, the idea is, is that there's that aesthetic appreciation occurs of the natural world, but where there's rules and sort of norms that guide how we do it in the art world as art historians, as art, art critics, that's not true of the natural world. As long as you're appreciating it as nature, then you're fine, right? And one of the problems with this view is that in some ways it, it uh, doesn't give us any aesthetic advice, right? We want to have like sort of aesthetic advice about how we should or shouldn't appreciate things in the natural world. Another issue too with it is that um, it sort of privileges a formalist way of appreciating the natural world. It presupposes that um, we can think about the perception of the natural world independently of our different frameworks in which we do it, right? So that's generally um, something that people try to avoid. So there's sort of a attempt to move between these two poles, right? Of saying that, that nature aesthetics can't happen and saying that it can happen, but it, that it's an anything goes endeavor. So that's what we're gonna be trying to do. Right? And in the literature, there's sort of goals in the last, since the nineties about that people have developed. Uh, accounts of nature aesthetics should do these things. And it sort of comes out of attempting to avoid these two poles. So one idea is that anything perceived goal, anything that can be perceived can be perceived aesthetically. So this idea is uh, a central sort of way of thinking about how it is that we don't need to have aesthetic experience connected to only art, right? Because you can aesthetically appreciate any, anything in the world, including natural phenomena. Another though, is that as we appreciate the natural world, we should appreciate it as nature. Right? not as something artifactual. Um, so this is the nature as nature principle. The next is the unified aesthetic principle. And this idea is that our aesthetic account should unify as much variety of aesthetic phenomena as possible. Right? And here the idea is that as we develop our theories, we should be able to articulate you know, art cases, uh, natural cases, and mixed cases. And that would be ideal, right? We don't want our art aesthetics and, and politics aesthetics and nature aesthetics to be totally distinct from each other. It would be nice if they hung together. And the objectivity is the sort of most surprising one, but this is something that people attempt to do. They try to articulate how, how make possible the objectivity of aesthetic value in the natural world, right? And this is especially important if you want to argue for a connection between nature aesthetics and environmental ethics. Because you want to be able to say that, yeah, wilderness, the beauty of wilderness, the sublimity of a, wild, of a wild place like the Grand Canyon, for instance, is something that um, is objectively, right, of aesthetic value, and we should preserve it for that reason, so that you can convince pe people who are, you know, economists or politicians, right, <laughs> effectively. Um, the, the last is the aesthetics ethics nexus, the attempt to, like, bring together uh, not nature aesthetics with environmental ethics, make contact with a broader account. So this is, these are five different goals for nature aesthetics. These are the different views that are out there. Um, 
this is a project and kind of cataloging those views and trying to argue for an additional view. So scientific cognitivism is the main view. Uh, the engagement view is had for years in the 90s and to up to the present been opposed to the cognitivist view. There's the empathetic imagination view, the emotions view, and then the view I argue for enacting nature's value, right? Each of these views have their strengths and each of them have their problems, right? And the task is to articulate what their strengths and weaknesses are and see how to defend possible new views, okay? And this gives you a map of the terrain, right? Roughly, this map is outlined in terms of cognitive views and non-cognitive views, right? Cognitive views say that in nature aesthetics, there are requirements of cognitive states, judgments, beliefs, thoughts, right? You have to know something in order to appreciate. Non-cognitive views tend to suggest that you don't need to know things. It's not required that you have knowledge, beliefs, concepts, et cetera, right? That's a one way to distinguish this. These different views sort of developed in the 90s, since the mid 90s, and we're now at a kind of second generation point where people are asking, well, what, what ways forward? Like, what are the ways forward? How do we develop new views? And how do we mediate the conversations that have occurred, right? So we'll go through these views and articulate the reasons to adopt them. This is a quote from the main, the person who has done the most work throughout the, this period of the development of nature aesthetics, uh, Alan Carlson. He has defended scientific cognitivism. So he says in one of his main books, to appropriately appreciate objects or landscapes in question, natural environments aesthetically, to appreciate their grace, majesty, elegance, charm, cuteness, delicacy, or disturbing weirdness or tidal basin, it is necessary to perceive them in their correct categories. This requires knowing what they are and knowing something about them. In the cases in question, like perceiving a roar coal whale, a moose, a tidal basin, something of biology and geology. In general, it requires the knowledge given by the natural sciences. So he thinks that when you're appreciating the natural world, what is a natural environment? It's what the natural scientists study. What's, what's psychologically relevant for appreciating them? The categories that objectively describe the natural world, right? How should we appreciate them? Well, we should come to know those categories. We should get a field guide and figure out what the scientific categories are in the natural world. And this will disclose the types of perceptions that are available to us. Okay. And there's lots of arguments that I've analyzed and sort of developed in the longer project, but there's basically five of them, right? And I'll just give you the reasons, I give them as sort of main reasons. Why, why adopt scientific cognitivism? One reason to adopt it is that it distinguishes effectively art aesthetics and nature aesthetics. So we wanna be able to articulate what's different about the natural and the artific artifactual. What's different about the environment and the framed? Right, and one of the things that he says is that natural um, natural categories from the sciences help us to not think about the natural world as from a scenic point of view. For instance, right, we don't need to use a post if we use a postcard to appreciate nature, then we're not appreciating it as the environment that it is. Right, if we take an object aesthetically out of its context, then we're not appreciating it as natural. Right, if you take a rock from the beach, it becomes an artifact to you. Right, appreciate it in its context. So we think scientific cognitivism helps with that. Category theory argument suggests that there's similarities between art and nature appreciation. And the idea here is that there are kind of standards that the different categories give you in the context of art appreciation, right? So if you're appreciating a Pollock, a Jackson Pollock painting, then you need to know certain things about art history. You need to know certain things about uh, uh, our critics discussion. You need to know certain things about the context, right? And those normative standards are in the art world, but they're also in the, the natural world. And so you get an analogy here. The objectivity argument is basically like scientific categories are objective. So if you wanna appreciate the natural world in objective terms, then you should use those scientific categories and they're the best case, right? Science is the measure of thing, what is and what is not. And so obviously that's going to give you the measure of what it is that you should, uh, you should say about 
the natural world. And the positive aesthetics argument, positive aesthetics is the idea that if you have negative reactions, if you have a reaction of disgust to a carcass, then you should change that negative reaction in some way and see if you can move towards a positive appreciation. And he, he thinks if you have fear of snakes and spiders, then you can come to have a positive appreciation by adopting scientific categories, understanding the role that snakes and spiders play in the natural world, right? And once you understand those roles, then you can change the attitudes that you have. He also thinks that scientific cognitivism best, best gives us a kind of connection to um, environmental economics and environmental policy, right? Because their social sciences and the sciences um, can hang out together and integrate views. We would want views that like scientific cognitivism to be able to convince people of the certain kinds of aesthetic qualities we want in the natural world. So those are roughly the five arguments that I found in this account. Some problems with this view. So first, common sense categories seem like they could be sufficient for the aesthetic appreciation of nature, right? Making scientific categories necessary seems like unreasonable, unreasonably exclusionary or even elitist, right? So why, why adopt that? Another is that scientific categories also don't always bring us into contact with aesthetic experiences. Sometimes it's the case that using scientific categories leads us to get into an observational frame, explaining and predicting what we're doing, right? And in terms of unobservable things. It also seems like it operates at a sort of view from nowhere, right? A try, an attempt to depict the world as, you know, what it actually is factually, right? And an objective in that sense of objectivity and rules out the subjective take on it, right? So scientific cognitivism also in his particular view focuses on wilderness as a natural environment of concern. And since there's so little of that that remains, it seems like there's lots more to appreciate in the natural world, which counts as nature, but doesn't count as, as wilderness. It also privileges sort of modern conceptions of aesthetic experience, which we can get into in the q and I guess. Uh, there's questions of why is it that we should have a disinterested attitude about the natural world, right? And he sort of argues that scientific cognitivism leads to the possibility of a disinterested attitude. You can step back and judge with, with science whether you're describing things accurately or not. And so you can do the same thing in the context of aesthetic appreciation. It also happens to focus only on beauty as a key category. So another view is the engagement view. And this is an explicit, explicitly non-cognitive view. The engagement view holds that what's important in our nature appreciation is our bodily engagement with the natural world. He focuses on sensuality. There's a philosopher named Arnold Berlitz who focuses on sensuality, on sensuousness, on our sensation, our, the sensation and perception of the natural world as an embodied experience. Um, and this view is a non-cognitive view because it says that Knowledge, beliefs, concepts, categories aren't really necessary, right? You can aesthetically appreciate the natural world just by being a body, having a body and going into the natural world and experiencing it, right? Um, he also thinks sometimes scientific categories get in the way of your appreciation. If you go and look at the field guide rather than appreciating the plant itself and, and engaging with it in perception, then you've distracted yourself from what it is that you should uh, experience. So the engagement view is, most, is the most explicitly non-cognitive view. It focuses on the sensuous feeling of the body and the engagement of movement, right? And he basically thinks this is enough for aesthetically appreciating the natural world. It's also a multi-sensory account. It focuses on the experience of the natural world and deprivileges senses like vision and audition, right? which are prox, which are um, uh, distal senses. It focuses on instead very proximal senses, experiences of your body, proprioception, and experiences of your bodily movement. And this becomes central to, uh, to the engagement view. It challenges ideas of disinterestedness. Um, Berliant and others arguing for the engagement view argue that interest in aesthetic properties is pivotal to your engagement with it, right? So disinterestedness is sort of his, his question. It also focuses a lot on immersion, right? So for Berliant and for other engagement thinkers, the key experience you're, got, you're, you're aiming for 
is to be immersed, to feel like the subject and object disappears, to feel like your consciousness shuts down, your concept shut down, you stop thinking about things and you find yourself embedded in the natural world, right? So that's the kind of goal of the aesthetic experience. And the way that Berlian thinks about it is that he thinks that focusing on the body and bodily movement means we can like reshape the way that we think about appreciation in general. So it gives us a unified aesthetic and it makes us actually critique the, the, the kind of dominance of painting and sculpture and drawing on the one hand and like music and theater and like makes us, it makes us think, why are those the dominant ones? Well, it's mostly because vision and audition are sort of privileged in art aesthetics. But if we do nature aesthetics, that will reorient and deprivilege those distal senses and more in, in terms of more proximal senses. And that might give us a different picture of how we should aesthetically appreciate art. So some problems with the view is it's sort of dependent on particular frameworks. So if you think about John Dewey and you think about Marlou Ponty, you'll understand what, what um, Berlant is doing and the engagement view, but he doesn't otherwise argue for the view. He doesn't tell you what, doesn't give you any other aesthetic advice. He sort of do phenomenology and you'll get it, which I think is interesting. And yeah, it can, you can discover things through that, but it doesn't give you further advice. Um, it also has trouble meeting any goal other than the unified aesthetic goal, right? Which is a great goal to articulate, but it doesn't, it doesn't help us with any of the other goals. Another view is the empathetic imagination view. So this view is focused on sympathy or empathy or the perspective taking with the natural world, right? Um, it also focuses on imagination. So there's uh, two views that I sort of summarize in this context. One is um, Yuriko Saito's view. Yuriko Saito has argued for what she calls the folk narrative view, right? Or what's called folk cognitivism. So she says, listening to nature as nature, I believe, must involve recognizing its own reality apart from us. It includes acknowledging that a natural object has its own unique history and function independent of historical, cultural, literary significance given by humanity, as well as its specific perceptual features. Appreciating nature on its own terms, therefore, must be based upon listening to a story nature tells of itself and through all its perceptual features, that is a story concerning its origin, makeup, function, and working independent of human presence and involvement. So, this is a form of sympathetic imagination or perspective taking with the world so that the natural world tells you its own story. The way that people put this is it's listening to nature on its own terms, not in terms of human language, human concepts, human, even human practices. Okay. So this view um, is thinking in terms of a kind of sympathy that removes the human from it, right? in order to experience something directly that the natural world tells you. The imagination view by Emily Brady, she gives a good quote, a uh, good summary of it. Imagination encourages a variety of possible perceptual perspectives on a single natural object or set of objects, thereby expanding and enriching appreciation. Hepburn points to imagination's power to shift attention flexibly from aspect to aspect of the natural objects before one, to shift focus from close up to long shot, from textual detail to overall atmospheric haze or radiance, to overcome stereotype grouping and cliched ways of seeing. Perception also supports the activity of imagination by providing the choreography of our imaginings. In these ways, the perceptual qualities of the aesthetic object, as well as the imaginative power of the percipient come together to direct aesthetic appreciation. So according to this view, imagination is central to aesthetic appreciation. And, it's, it, and there are different kinds of imagination that she defends in this way. Exploratory imagining is basically um, you're having perceptions and then you're allowing yourself to free associate, right? So there's a kind of imagination that involves going to look at this, the, uh, this landscape, a Canadian landscape, uh, a lake in, in Western Canada and the jack, a jack pine at a lake and just allowing yourself to have perceptions that relate to other things, sort of like associate, associationistic imagining, that's exploratory. Projective imagination is putting yourself in the perspective of the jackpot, right? You're 
you're projecting yourself into the experience. Amplitude of imagination is connecting your perceptions to other perceptions and building a kind of systematic experience of, of what you would imagine would occur in that place. Um, this is actually closest to this kind of scientific cognitivist view because it involves connecting holistically uh, from your perceptions to other possible things you might perceive. And uh, revelatory imagine is basically a form of imagination that she thinks is central to her, to her view. And it, this is why she's generally categorized in the, in the empathetic imagination context. For her, she thinks that there's a form of imagination that allows the natural world to be disclosed. And so the revelatory imagination is basically you perceive and then you perceive what, it, what kinds of things you can discover. You imagine what kinds of things you could discover by way of perceiving that. And then things are revealed to you, right? So it's sort of like this idea of uh, there's an appearance and then your imagination enables you to like think about what would be revealed. What kinds of aesthetic truths can I discover here is the, is the, is the sort of question and you build a narrative around that. And that's, that's what you should be appreciate. So some worries about this view. One is that it has difficulty distinguishing between factual perspectives and taking and fictional perspective taking in the natural world, right? So one of the difficulties with the with the folk narrative view is that it seems like it's hard to make sense of listening to nature on its own terms, right? And how would we distinguish between like fictionally doing so and factually doing so? Um, another problem is that it seems like empathy and imagination are terms that are sort of appealed to in a lot of contexts that are just sort of like meant to solve the problem, but we don't really know what they are. Like they mean a lot of different things. And so we sometimes appeal to terms in philosophy like empathy will help us. But then when we look at what empathy is, it's lots of different things that are sort of vague or ambiguous or we haven't really discovered yet. And that's sort of true in the context of, of imagination. People think about think that imagination can sort of help us, but there's lots of different accounts of what imagination is, and we're not quite sure what it is. So I call that the junkyard of the mind problem, right? There's sort of there's something about it that's appealing, but we're not quite sure what, what those things mean. So it's difficult to articulate whether it's going to be successful or not. Another view is the emotions view. In this view, if you focus on something that probably everyone has experienced, the largeness of a waterfall. The idea here is that emotions are, emotions are sufficient, right? All we need to be able to do is go in front of some aspect of a natural environment and experience certain emotional reactions, affective states. So here, experiencing the grandeur of a waterfall involves the emotional responses to the largeness of a waterfall. No, Noel Carroll defends this view. He says, if someone denies being moved by the waterfall, but agrees the waterfall is large scale and says nothing else, we are apt to suspect that this response, as well as judgment issued on the basis of that response, is inappropriate. But he thinks, no, that's not true. Like we could definitely have experiences of, of the largeness, and that can be that can be sufficient, right? Do we need scientific categories in order to do that? Um, what he argues is that emotions can be assessed as being appropriate and inappropriate in a lot of different ways, right? So all you need in order to figure out what, whether you can appreciate the natural world correctly or not is have some measure of the content of those emotions being appropriate or inappropriate. And he does this in terms of um, the formal object, the formal object conception of emotions. So in this case, he says, my fear of the tank, the particular object of my emotion is appropriate, but it must satisfy the criterion that I believe that the tank is dangerous to me. So every emotion has like a cognitive component for him and a non-cognitive component. And the cognitive component can be correct or not, right? So in the context of the tank, if it's like an old tank that, you know, is in the town square or whatever, that is never going to run again, right? Then it doesn't make sense. It's not actually a dangerous object. It's like a statue or something, right? An artifact. Um, and that's why kids climb on it. But if it's an actual tank, then it is something that's actually dangerous. And then the cognitive content of being afraid of it in the, in the context of war might be an appropriate response, right? So similarly, that's true in the context of nature. There's gonna be certain kinds of things that we should represent as being dangerous and other kinds not. 
And so we can make sense of there being appropriateness and inappropriateness of emotions in this context, right? That's what Carol argues. So he argues, you know, you could have aesthetic experience though and be wrong about the scientific category, but nevertheless be right about the emotional content, right? So if you experience, if you experience a whale, right? And you experience it coming out of the water, he says, I may, move, I may be moved by its size, its force, the amount of water it displaces, but I may think that it's a fish. And nevertheless, by being moved by the grandeur of the blue whale, it's not inappropriate, right? Because they're grand, they're huge. So it's not inappropriate. It is the type of, of organism being as big as it is that it makes sense to have a response of this is a large organism. Being moved by nature remains a way of appreciating nature that may coexist with the natural environmental model, which is the scientific cognitive model. So, you know, there's questions about whether emotions can be deep and can be shallow. Um, some people have argued, some people have argued that the emotions view runs into a sort of dilemma, right? Um, the dilemma argument against it goes roughly like. Uh, if we focus on the cognitive, emotions have cognitive components and non-cognitive components, we focus on the cognitive component, then it seems no different than the scientific view. Because we're basically already saying, like, is it true or not that spiders and snakes are dangerous? And then you get into the question of, well, what do the ecologists say? Like, I'm unreasonably afraid about this spider, but it's not a venomous spider. The ecologist or the biologist can say, hey, look, it's not, right? So you shouldn't be afraid of it. But that kind of check on the cognitive component of your emotion seems to be not just a common sense thing. It seems like the check comes in uh, by deferring to certain kinds of scientific cognitive, scientific categories. So if we focus on the non-cognitive component of emotions, like for instance, perceptions of changes in your bodily states when you're afraid of a snake or a spider, you're not just representing it as being dangerous, you're also aware of like the change, right? You're aware of like wanting to move away or wanting to kill it or just be, not being able to do anything, right? So if that, if we're talking about that, then it doesn't seem to arise to appreciations of the world. We're just sort of reflecting on changes in our bodies, right? Not as they are in relation to the world. Also too, some have argued that emotions are on a par are, all on a, are, are not all on a par in enabling the aesthetic appreciation of nature, right? So some of the issue here has turned into, well, maybe there are pivotal emotions, like core ones for aesthetic appreciation, and other ones aren't really relevant, but Carol's view attempts to defend all of these, right? So some people have argued all wonder and mystery um, are the pivotal ones. But when we start to think about what it is that's in the content of those emotions, this seems to lead to a kind of like paradoxical state, wonder or mystery especially, right? Because it's an attempt to represent something and aspire to represent something about the world and sort of come up short. And then like an anxiety and not representing it, right? And that content seems to be not a very good guide for aesthetic appreciation. You either have to grasp the mystery or you don't. And um, so people have argued against that. So the view, the view that I defend is called en enacting nature's value. And what I argue in, the, in a few papers is that I think we should focus on action and integrate the different views through thinking about action, thinking about kinds of, and especially a, a form of aesthetic agency where the aesthetic appreciation of the natural world is understood as a kind of skill to action. So I'll go through what that view is. So according to this account, uh, the ENV account, aesthetic appreciation of the natural world is a type of skill to action that involves aesthetic agency. Aesthetic agency is uh, a type of doing, right? That has its own responsibility and has its own you know, control and own kind of uh, uh, intentions that are involved in it. One of the things that I think is a benefit of my view is there's lots of discussions about is the, should we be cognitivists or non-cognitivists? And I think action is the best place to integrate these two views, right? So I think I can 
I can defend a view that captures the intuitions of cognitivism, but without going all the way into non-cognitivism, right? So uh, capturing the intuitions of cognitivism, one of the key ideas is that you have to have some requirement. It can't be an anything goes endeavor. That's appreciating the natural environment. There has to be some requirement that you have to do something or know something. So I think you have to have competence knowledge or know-how, knowing how to perceive, knowing how to gain uh, aesthetic experiences through perception of the natural world. I think it can also capture the intuitions of non-cognitivism though, because it doesn't, uh, while not committing to focusing on a particular phenomenology, right? We can think about the awareness of action instead of just the awareness of bodily states, right? So one of the worries about the engagement view and about the non-cognitive side of the emotions view is that we're only focusing on bodily changes or bodily arousal. But if we focus on action, then we can privilege how bodily movement uh, is involved in meeting certain kinds of goals. So it focuses on intentional action as being central to nature appreciation. So does it meet the goals for accounts of nature aesthetics becomes the big question. And I think it can meet the anything perceived idea. So enacting nature's value can capture the idea that anything that can be perceived can be perceived aesthetically because it focuses on aesthetic agency, not the objects appreciated. The problem, the, the problem with the anything view, the, the, the sort of uh, non-aesthetic view is that, you know, only art objects count as something that can be aesthetically appreciated. But if we shift our attention towards the kind of agency that we should be engaging in and the kinds of actions we should be taking, then we could have, we could talk about any cases. We could talk about uh, food, we could discuss nature, we could discuss art, we could discuss uh, you know, uh, handshaking, high fives, whatever we want, right? As beings, and, and then we could ask, well, are, are we uh, aware of the kind of skills that we're cultivating as agents in this place? in this space, whatever it is. Um, the nature as nature. Uh, enacting nature's value can capture the idea that aesthetic appreciation of nature as nature because it focuses on the aesthetic properties of wildness, which involve experiences of nature out of human control. So the way I didn't talk about this in the way I've summarized it, but I think when, the, when you were asking the ontology question, what is, what is a natural environment? We can focus on certain kinds of properties that, are, that give us access to why agency is important. So I think wildness is one of these properties. So if you experience the wildness of the natural world, you can experience it being outside of human control. And that's a way of, of experiencing, um, you know, this counts as a natural environment because it's outside of my control. And then also you can experience why it is that agency becomes so pivotal, right? So I think the, the, the what I basically, what I'm basically arguing is that the nature as nature component can be met insofar as we just define what's natural as being wild or outside of human control. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to be wilderness. It could just be wildness as a state of activity, right? And that can be sufficient. The Enacting nature's value can unify the variety of aesthetic phenomena because aesthetic agency unifies the diverse accounts. So I think within the context of thinking about each of the accounts, scientific cognitivism, um, the emotions view, the, the an activist view, uh, there's different kinds of psychological phenomena that are appealed to. But I think agency can unite these. They can each be understood as a type, a type of action, right? So if you understand your bodily movements in terms of, well, what kind of emotion am I engaging in when I'm sad, right? And how would that be relevant to appreciating it? Well, it's the kind of activity you're performing, right? The kind of, you know, like crying or, or uh, you know, slouching and, and curling up in a ball or whatever, right? So these are all actions in certain ways. Categorizing the natural world count as actions. So I think we can unify the aesthetic phenomena through thinking about the different ways that action plays a role in these different psychological states. And enacting nature's value can make it possible to think of the objectivity of aesthetic value 
but it's just understood in terms of satisfaction conditions rather than correctness conditions. So we can make it, we can make sense of how it is that an intentional action is successful or not in terms of its goals, right? So we could say something like, um, it has a, a world to mind direction of fit rather than mind to world direction of fit, right? So my perception, I perceive this piece of paper as being white. It's objectively the case that my perception represents it as being white because my perception has a mind to world direction of fit, right? But when I desire a white piece of paper to write on, right? And, and then I get one, it's satisfied. Right, And so my desire being satisfied is a way of thinking about how it is that we should understand aesthetic agency. Just think of it in terms of, you can have a form of objectivity that's understood in terms of satisfaction conditions. Um, if you have certain goals and appreciating, then those goals can be realized by a variety of means. And there's sort of, uh, there's ones that satisfy those goals and ones that don't. And we can understand objectivity in those terms. EMV or environmental enacting nature's value can connect with the broader accounts of environmental value because we can understand types of aesthetic re responsibility that follow from this account. We can be motivated to have care and concern for the natural world through that kind of uh, nature appreciation. So I think we should think about aesthetic responsibility and what kind of responsibility we have to kind of cultivate our skills to appreciate the natural world. And I, th I think and there's some research that suggests this, that the more you do that, the more motivated you would be to care for it, right? Um, if you go out in a wilderness area, you go out in a wild place and you try to appreciate it, you will come to have care and concern for it in deeper ways, right? So I think that's where the connection, the connection is made. So there's lots of few possible future directions to go, right? And like I said in the beginning, this literature developing in the 90s, we're at the second generation point. Like I'm, I'm trying to restructure the discussion and think about possible future directions, right? So there's some things that I think really should happen in the second generation. One is to bring it, bring the eco-feminist philosophy into context with, with nature aesthetics, right? I think there's lots to be said about how it is that um, feminism can help us to re-articulate some of the assumptions. Uh, one glaring one, is the way that people talk about wilderness in the context of nature aesthetics, often using terms like virgin wilderness, right? So that's an issue. That's something that like, it's not just the way people are, it's the way it's framed. It's the way nature is sort of historically discussed, right? So those are super important. Also in the context of um, literature on black aesthetics, there's definitely Paul Taylor's work, philosophy of black aesthetics is a critique of visuality and a critique of the dominance of visuality and aesthetics. I think that's deeply important and can be connected, right? Um, I also think there's, there's lots of movement in environmental philosophy in general and environmental ethics to privilege indigenous voices in the context of thinking about justice concerns. And so the same should occur in the context of uh, uh, nature aesthetics. So this, uh, in the second generation, there's lots of stuff that's happening Lots of uh, anthologies coming out uh, in this context, sort of reconceiving whose voices uh, have been in the discussion. And the second is to think about a deeper history of philosophy of aesthetics. And all of these views since the 90s have, have had their favorite hi history of philosophy figures, right? And so one of the things that I think is deeply missing is a uh, reflection on romanticism. So hardly any of the views reflect on German Romanticism, British Romanticism, sort of development of those views. Uh, so it's discussed, but it's not as central. Uh, so certain, certain kinds of figures in the history of philosophy get discussed, but I think more reflection on that needs to occur. Um, I think also there's a trend towards thinking about in, in aesthetics, thinking about empirical aesthetics or neuroaesthetics as being central, right? So I think there should be a movement towards thinking about how cognitive science and neuroscience can answer some of these questions, but also show how there'd be sort of limitations to that, right? Um, but there's, there's definitely something that empirical aesthetics can, can contribute. 
And the last is being explicit about how it is that nature aesthetics plays a role in understanding environmental value. So there's lots of literature now on sort of climate change aesthetics. How is it that, that thinking about um, natural disasters in the context of anthropogenic climate change, how would aesthetics be relevant to that, right? And how would the variability and the, the kind of sort of perceptual changes that people experience with natural disasters lead to different ways of understanding climate change and climate change effects? So people have thought about that. Um, also too, you know, conservation is, is deeply connected to aesthetic experience. So uh, there's been actual cases of people protect, protecting wilderness areas from becoming quarries, for instance, by arguing that there would be aesthetic properties that had been lost, right? So this is sort of like explicit applied nature aesthetics of going to a place that needs to be conserved and then arguing why it is that, that beauty would be lost, sublimity would be lost or other aesthetic properties. Um, so that would be a sort of normative approach. So there's lots of other possible directions that, that we can go. Thank you so much. Thanks. <clears throat>